So as a whole, this is most focused on project leadership. Um, so, and I'd actually define that in a, in a lot of cases as not necessarily the doers, the contributors on the project, but the people who their role is to protect the outcome of the project and to help it reach success working with the team. Um, and you'll see why I get to that distinction when I actually get to defining what I'm talking about. But I should start with who I am. So I'm Adam Edgerton. I've been a project manager, project leader type of sorts for six, seven years now. Um, I was up until a few months ago at Metal Toad here in town and recently made a move to Instrument. So uh, this is a near and dear subject to my heart. Uh, it's something that I can re relate to personally right now and have at several points in my past career. And I think it's something that many people will experience throughout their career for better or for worse. So I want to start with a story from Metal Toad. This was three and a half years ago. Uh, aptly named, my first big project there was called FearNet. And so the idea was basically take their old, old CMS. It was a Comcast CMS. I didn't even know they made one. Uh, migrated over into open source, uh, redesign it along the way, migrate all their data, integrate with 15 different APIs. Very complex project, kind of a tight budget and a tight schedule. And this was my first experience on the agency side of things. I'd come from client side before that. So, I mean, you have stakeholders of some sort, regardless of the type of project. But for me, this was a demanding client stakeholder down in LA, big entertainment industry, well connected. And so I'm like, oh, we need to ship them something cool at the end. Um, so I found myself in a situation where I was under some pressure I wasn't quite used to. And it was one where I wasn't necessarily as in control of the outcome as I wanted to be, partly because of some of those integrations along the way. Uh, that always tends to muddle things. And found myself throughout the course of this project knowing exactly the steps I needed to take to make the project successful. Going through those steps and still in the back of my mind wondering, like, oh, I'm forgetting something. Why is this project going to fail? And that feeling of failure and that fear of failure along the way kind of compounded towards the end of the project to the point where on paper, like if I, and I did this exercise several times, on paper I went through and I said, okay, these are the 18 things that I need to be aware of. I'm on top of, or I think I'm on top of all of them, but I must be forgetting something. And that paranoia kind of crept in to the point where probably in QA, three, four weeks before launch, I found myself almost out of nervousness looking around at other jobs. And it wasn't that I had any logical or rational reason for why my job might be at risk, but it was still, my own self-evaluation of, oh, I must be forgetting something, I must be making mistakes. That was my own first really strong experience with Project Fear. A more recent example is starting an instrument. And the reason this has happened for me is I was brought in to support a new executive producer. I was brought in as the senior experienced project manager. And so the expectation of me is I know what I'm doing. The expectation of myself is also that I know what I'm doing. But it also can create this weird sort of paranoia where it's, well, I think I know what I'm doing, but am I doing it your way? Is this actually going to result in success? I've had similar projects in the past, and they were successful, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not going to fail on this one. So again, it's, and the good news is, because I've experienced this before, I'm a little bit more aware at this time, and I'm a little bit more able to shut those inner voices in my head off or understand why they're happening. So to kind of start where, with why this is happening, uh, I'm sure, especially in the development world, many of you are familiar with imposter syndrome. Um, I'm going to, I'll read the definition of it just so everybody else is on the same page. So the definition from whatever said, I think it was probably Wikipedia, a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist even in, face of, in the face of information that indicates the opposite is true. So that's my own personal, well, I think I know what I'm doing, but I still feel like I might not be good at this. And in the development world, I know it's really common because it's a very learning-based activity. You know, many developers will tell you as many years as they spend coding, they still, still spend half their time on Google. And you're also trying to solve problems that haven't been solved before. And so there's a strong relation there in a project leadership role where you may have seen similar stakeholders or a similar problem that you're trying to solve, but the solution and the approach that you take is going to be somewhat unique every time. So it's not 100% guarantee of success that whatever you did last time is going to work again. Um, it's also important to note that imposter syndrome is often associated with the highest achievers. Um, so the more strongly you feel it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It could be a good thing. Um, just realize that 
the type of personality who wants to be a high achiever is also more likely to feel this sort of thing. Um, and then I had a Tina Fey quote that I liked, so I'm going to throw that in there as well. I'm a fraud. Oh, God, they're onto me. I'm a fraud. So you just try to ride the egomania when it comes and enjoy it, and then slide through the idea of fraud along the way. So I have three definitions of project fear, and they're all very related, and they're really just subtle tweaks on each other and on imposter syndrome. The first one is illustrated by our lovely backseat driver here. It's the imposter syndrome coupled with the fact that you're not necessarily in control. And I say that because you've got a team of people you're working with, and you can't ultimately control the work they do or don't do. You can have a lot of say, and you can guide that, and you can use motivation tactics and keep your team as cohesive as possible. But at the end of the day, your job is to organize. Your job is not necessarily to do. And so I mean, there, there's times where you'll also be the doer, but ultimately there will be many parts of the project that may be out of your control. So the second one, and this is maybe more a situation than a definition, but this is where you don't necessarily doubt your lack of control. It's more you feel like you're the driver, but you also see yourself driving straight off of a cliff, and the cliff is a project that feels like it's going to fail. Um, this one's definitely more situation-oriented in that there are some projects where they feel doomed from the start. I know I can relate to having been brought, in a, you know, brought into a project that was sold where I look at the statement of work and immediately realize that it's not possible and that we need to go back to the drawing board on day one. Um, this tends to get worse the later in the project it is that you're brought in or the later that you have a chance to speak your mind on it. And the third definition, and this one is often the most tenured project leads, is kind of the realization that your job is to keep things tidy, keep things organized, and clean up the messes along the way. And so the, you know, the analogy would be, you just finished cleaning aisle three, you move on to aisle four, but you realize aisle two that you finished last week is a mess again, and you have to go clean that one up after you're done with aisle four. And that can feel like what it is with multiple projects at the same time. Um, it's kind of a compounding thing over time that can be hard to deal with, where you may have 90% of your projects that are very successful, and then that one that fails, and that one that fails will stick with you for a long time, and it can be hard to get past it. So as far as who's affected, um, I want to say everybody to some extent. You know, whether you're, and so it could be you're a developer on a project, it could be you are the project manager, it could be you're the owner of the organization that needs to deliver, but I think everybody to some extent really does have some peace in success and failure and has those opportunities to ultimately control the outcome of a project. Um, but definitely new project managers, new project leads, people who have less experience or who doubt themselves is a really common situation where you're going to feel this. Um, my own case right now, onboarding, is a really common one where I've got the experience to back me up to know what I'm doing, but I don't have the organizational nuance to know, is this how they want it done? Um, you can certainly ask those questions along the way, but even then, you have to feel out exactly how far you can go in questions, how much you want to just kind of go the cowboy route and you know, do it and then apologize later if it doesn't turn out as expected. Um, there's the knowingly doomed project case that I talked to earlier. That's a really common time when you'll feel it. There's also the case where, and it was really more related to my FearNet example, where you feel like the project is on cruise control, Everything is in line, everything is in order. You've managed to organize to the best of your ability, and there's still this nagging feeling that you may be forgetting something, or there's still some reason that it will fail anyway. So as far as if you can relate, and I'm curious, just a quick raise of hands if so far anything has related to a situation you've been in. Good number of hands, yeah. So if you can answer yes to any of the following, you've probably experienced some project fear. If you're feeling underwater, if there's a feeling that there's always something more to be done on a project, that's one good case. Uh, if you're feeling helpless or like there's not a solution, not seeing any good solutions to the complex problems you're trying to face, that's a very common situation. Um, if you're feeling that despite your best efforts, the project's going to fail, like I mentioned. If you're feeling on the defense, and this one's one we'll touch on more, but if you're feeling like not with the client or with whoever the ultimate stakeholder is, but with your own team, if you feel like you're on the defense, that can be a situation where these types of feelings creep in. And if you're like me and you felt the job hunting impulses and it wasn't necessarily that your job was at any risk, but you still felt paranoid that it might be, you've probably experienced some project fear. 
As far as how it manifests, there's a couple of different ways. Um, this is certainly one. It's a very common one, is putting on a poker face and keeping on. Uh, this one, as you know, my previous position, I actually managed a team of project managers. And this was the most dangerous one for me because it was the hardest to smell out and really help people who were facing this type of scenario. And when they put on a poker face, little cracks would form in their projects, but it would be hard to note them until all of a sudden the entire project was just on fire. Um, so that's a, this is a really dangerous one. There's also the overreaction mode. I've seen people who get into kind of frantic, not really planning type of situations. They just do and they react and they try to fight fires. Uh, there's underreaction. There's almost the paralysis uh, approach where you don't know what to do, so you don't do anything, and you sit on your hands. That's a really easy one, luckily, to spot. Um, and I should note that hopefully this talk, for those of you who can't relate so much, realize that other people on your team might be feeling this. And as I go through some ways to cope later on in the presentation, definitely bring those types of thoughts to people and help call out it top project fear when you see it. Um, there's also the other one, that, the other related to a poker face is the keeping busy but on low value work. Um, so if you don't see the right solution and the way to pursue it, you find trivial tasks to keep yourself busy, but things that ultimately aren't going to solve the problem. And this one's another really easy trap to fall into. As far as where you end up, um, there's certainly the element of how many hours you're working. If you're gonna put in 60, 70, 80 hour work weeks, you are gonna burn out eventually. But I've seen people burn out working less than 40 hours a week where they couldn't stay healthy, they got sick a lot, and realize that there's a huge psychological factor to burnout. It's not just how many hours are you putting in. I've seen people work a month straight working 80 hour weeks because it was something they loved and wanted to do. But I've seen people work 40 hours and burn out because they were paranoid, scared, had project fear. And it's all related to stress. And I'm going to touch on that in a couple of slides. But there's a secondary thing here, too. Um, it often goes hand in hand with burnout. But sometimes it's kind of in place of burnout. And that's just showing apathy. And I know I felt this a little bit, where if I felt like I was constantly fighting an uphill battle or that for the best of my intentions and my best efforts, it was going to fail anyway. I found myself fighting a lot of feelings of apathy. Of, well, it doesn't matter what I do, so I'm going to not do anything. And the ultimate worst outcome there, which I've referred to again, is you have people quit or start job hopping. And as far as what that means for your organization and for yourself in a lot of cases, there are some very real dollar impacts to this problem. And so it's one that I want organizations to be aware of and help solve with their team members. Um, in the project management space, in particularly, retention is kind of poor. Um, specifically, if you talk agency side, but in general, I'd say average tenure, I run the local digital PM meetup group, and average tenure, we actually did a survey, and it was about a year, maybe a hair over a year. And it's really expensive to turn people over. I mean, I've done the numbers at Metal Toad and what it took us just to spend the time trying to hire somebody, training them, onboarding them, trying not to throw them into the fire head first with new projects on their first day. And that alone could be $50,000 of time and money and advertising and all that sort of things. Plus, chances for project failure and major project budget overage were much, much higher when we had people turning over versus continuous staff on it. So that could be, I mean, that could be a $100,000 project overage easily just from somebody turning over. So every time this sort of thing happens, it can have a huge financial impact. Um, there's also the, in general, uh, with that year turnover sort of thing, if you're constantly going through the cycle and you last a year, you burn out, you move somewhere else, generally the average lifespan of somebody, I think this is part of the reason people will fall out of tech, is five to ten years uh, before they move into, either they, they find a corporate cushy job at Intel that they're a cog in a machine and it bores them, not to offend anybody from Intel if you're here. <laughs> Um, or they move into some other type of career entirely, and it's because this cycle can be really destructive, and the more times you go through it, the harder it is to pick yourself back up from it. So as far as why it's happening, there's a few different causes, um, one of which, this is the onboarding scenario, but I do want to call out that I've experienced it helping other project managers onboard. I've experienced it myself onboarding. It really doesn't matter if you've got 
zero years of leading projects or 10 years of leading projects under your belt. Every time you start a new organization, there's a lot of learning that has to happen. Some of that's learning particular ways of doing things with clients or with stakeholders. Sometimes that's learning all of the nuances of departments and politics. Sometimes it's just learning specific processes. If there's a way they want things done or they don't have a specific way they want things done. Instruments are a good example. They're kind of, in a way, anti-process, and that's not to say they're not organized, but they very much value individual thought and strategic creative project management. So they intentionally kind of steer away from having universal processes, which has actually made it ambiguous in a few cases when I've come on board and nobody really had a clear answer for me. So I picked my way of doing it and then found out later that somebody didn't like that way. So there's benefits and drawbacks to both sides. But do be aware that bot, like basically I'd say bare minimum three months before somebody is going to be competent. And it depends on how long your project cycles are. If you're on two year projects, it's actually worse. If you're on one week projects, by three months, you've probably had somebody go through and see half a dozen. Three months is a good ben benchmark. Uh, a lot of web projects, especially that I've seen, tend to be somewhere in the three to six month range. So this is enough time to have somebody either shadow or take on their own project and really see the project life cycle start to finish. Six months is a really, uh, another really important milestone because that's when you've had two. So you've learned once and then you've gotten to apply it a second time. Usually you don't see any real mastery though until probably a year. So that's another reason that you don't want to see people turning over because of project fear, is you're ultimately not getting people fully trained up in all the nuances to the point where they can really grow and support the organization until somewhere between six months and a year. I can relate there now. I've been project managing for a long time. I'm at three and a half, four months, and I'm just now feeling like I've kind of got my feet under me at Instrument. I also want to touch on the four stages of competence, and I don't know if you've seen this. Hopefully you can read it. But there's basically four stages of learning, and when you're feeling project fear, this is a good tool to step back and think, is it partly because of something I know or don't know? Uh, so I'll walk through the stages. The first stage is unconscious incompetence. Um, so that means you don't know what you don't know. And you, it's a hard place to be because you don't know how to start learning in that case. The next stage is conscience and competence. So you're aware of your shortcomings. You're aware of what you don't know. This is often another project fear place. Really, most of the project fear will happen on the left side of this chart. Um, and it's, you can apply this very meta. You can apply it to you know, your practice as a whole, or you can apply it to, I need to learn this one specific aspect of a process. Um, and really, this can be applied to anything you're learning. But if you're aware of the skill you lack, that's another one where it can be very fear-inducing because you're on your way to trying to learn whatever it is you need to learn, but you don't know it yet. And so that's kind of the, it can relate in some cases to the, I think I'm on top of everything, but there's probably some things I'm forgetting. Because the more you're aware of your shortcomings, the more you probably feel that, oh, there's probably some stuff in this quarter, this quartile here, still here too. Uh, conscious competence is a great place to be. That means you've become aware of whatever you lacked, and then you've learned it. And it's also kind of cool to talk about a mentorship model on this, on this slide because for a while at Metal Toad, we had something set up where we had essentially senior developers mentoring junior developers or senior project managers mentoring junior project managers. And it was working, but it wasn't working as well as we wanted. And we realized that kind of what had happened is our most senior staff was at least conscious competence, if not unconscious competence. And by the time you move into this fourth quarter, it can be really hard to teach the people here or here because you've gotten into such a rhythm that it's basically muscle memory, whatever it is you're doing at that point. And so when you're in a mentorship model of some sort, and especially if you're trying to do it to ease project fear, think about basically working backwards. Have the most senior staff mentor the ones who are trying to get to that unconscious competence place. Have the consciously competent, the people who just learned a skill, teach it to the people who want to learn. Have the people who've become aware and are in the process of learning mentor and teach the people who need to just figure out what direction they're even going in. Another really common reason project fear happens is too much autonomy or too little. Uh, the too little case is you know what needs to happen, you have a solution in mind, and you feel like your hands are tied to do it. The alternative can be equally as bad. The alternative can be you have, you know, basically your organization has given you too much leeway not enough support, not enough guardrails to make sure that you feel safe in the project you're working on. 
So think about this situation. If you feel like you don't have control to feel safe in your project, um, autonomy plays a huge factor. And it's one where I think you can really call it out with your organization. And then there's the stress element. And this is a really important one because I wanted to break down stress into a couple of different dynamics. So stress is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I know it has a very negative connotation to it, but stress in certain situations can be really helpful and really positive. I know for me it can be a great motivator if I'm under a deadline. But important things to note, is it positive or negative stress? If it's something you're excited to work on, that's great. It's probably going to be positive stress if you're under a deadline. If it's something that you feel like you don't have a solution for or is really kind of negative bumming you out, that's also not going to work. The amount of stress is also important, the amount and the duration. Um, you can handle a low volume of stress for a long time. It will certainly build up over time, but you can handle it a lot longer than you can a very high burst of stress. And so the thing that I really prefer to see and sometimes try to foster is positive stress in short bursts. It often leads to the best productivity for me and for a lot of other people. And then there's the level of situational control, and I keep coming back to that word control, but it's a really important one because often the positive negative can be impacted by if you feel in control of your stress or not. So the, uh, the really common way to see stress be relieved is if somebody moves from not feeling in control of their situation to feeling in control, because then they know how to solve whatever is stressing them. And so that's often related to that stages of competence graph. That's often how stress can play a factor. Is if you feel like you have no control because you don't know what to do in a situation to get yourself out of that situation, you're going to feel a lot of negative stress and it may not go away anytime soon. There's also the project life cycle to consider. And so this is a very simplified gr uh, graph, but that's your project start and this is your project end. You can assume generally the case is going to be you're going to start with very little. Um, there may be some anticipation of there's a lot of moving parts and pieces, and if you're brought in later, it can be hard to get on top of it. Uh, the, the later you're brought into a project, if you're brought in halfway through and say, take this over and manage it, your grid is probably going to end up up here. It's just going to be a much steeper curve. Uh, so earlier is certainly better as far as, as, far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, whether it's project managers or just project leadership in general, having at least visibility into whatever the project is that you need to complete. Uh, things that compounded at the end, especially, are there's just more, it's, a, it's basically cognitive load. There's more going on that you have to keep track of, and no matter how organized you are, what your organizational system looks like, there's still going to be more factors to keep track of, versus going into a project cold, there's probably one thing you need to know, and that's when does the project kick off, and are there any notes that I should read, or a statement of work to look at. It's very simple. At the end, it's, there's 52 different QA tickets and 18 features that aren't complete, and the designer wants to change some things, and the client's got these three complaints, and it can actually be really overwhelming in some cases. The good news is, and this one, hopefully some of you can relate, I have a moment on just about every project, and it's, I call it the light bulb moment. It's kind of what it feels like, where I actually fully grasp what it is we're trying to do. And sometimes, the earlier it happens, the better. Um, sometimes it can happen really early. Sometimes if I've been involved in pre-sale, it happens by the time the statement of work gets signed. But basically, it's if you're brought in later, especially, this is kind of that you're going to start feeling uncertainty about what you're doing very quickly. And sometimes it can take just several hours pouring over documentation or talking with the team. It can take a lot of discovery meetings. It's hard to identify for me when it clicks or why it's going to, but all of a sudden it's like, okay, I get it. I understand the broad swath of what needs to happen. I understand the goals. I understand who the team is. I understand the dynamics. And it's a really control-inducing moment, or you feel like you're in control at that point. And it's one of the easiest ways to, if you feel like you've gotten away from that and you feel like a project has gotten away from you, think about that moment when you were there and think about ways to get back there. And if it's potentially just that you need to sit down and go into all of the documentation for two hours, uh, take that heads down time. But this is definitely one where just managing the project and not being more deeply involved with the project and understanding its nuances uh, often doesn't cut it for me, and you do have to go a little bit beyond with a, as, as a project manager to get there. As far as coping, because there is certainly some degree of this, it's going to happen. It still happens to me, I'm aware of it. The awareness is certainly a big piece. Um, generally, project manager types in particular tend to be risk averse. They tend to be planners, and when plans go awry, it can be hard to react. Um, 
acknowledge to some extent that you are potentially a risk-averse person, and that's okay. Also, think about, you know, for me personally, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm kind of the, I like to push the limits of risk a little bit, but not too much. It's what keeps the job fun and interesting for me. If a project is straightforward and there's no risk involved along the way, then I get bored. So that said, this is, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Alex Honnold. I happen to be a climber. And so Alex is famous for scaling half of the big wall climbs at Yosemite free solo, which means no rope or protection along the way. You don't have to be this risk enabling. You can be a little more risk averse than that. Climb it with a rope, essentially. <laughs> uh, this one's a really important one to consider, and it's often, I've actually, I've polled project managers because I was kind of curious on an empathy spectrum and on emotional intelligence where project managers fall, and it was kind of all over the spectrum as far as who I would consider successful in the role. In some cases, it was almost more one extreme than the other. It was either extreme low or extreme high if they took a test, but think about yourself and think, are you more a logical person or an emotional person? It's hard to, it's very much a spectrum, so it's hard to divide yourself into one camp or the other. But this is also another really useful exercise, is if you're a logical person, which I tend to fall a little bit towards that side of the spectrum, check in with the emotional side and realize, basically try to analyze the fear and say, is this something logical that I can write down on paper, this is my problem? Or is it something in my gut or heart or head and it's more on the emotional side of things? Because sometimes, especially if you're a very logical person, you can realize that emotions are driving you, but they're kind of subtle. You're not that in tune with them. And sometimes you just have to bring those to the surface and realize that they exist. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're more on the emotional side of the spectrum, think a little bit more logical and try to break things down and plan them out. Because often I've seen people, this is where you feel a little bit more paralyzed until you actually go through some sort of exercise to get whatever's in your head unstuck and out. And often just writing it down on paper makes a huge difference. Uh, show your work, and this is actually a little bit tricky, uh, especially when you feel like it's on a failing project. Um, it, can, it shouldn't be coming off as showing off like, yeah, I know the project's failing, but here's all these cool things I'm doing. Uh, it should more be, be willing to bring up problems when you see them. Feel free, like, feel free to call out concerns when you see them. Um, make a lot of noise, essentially, and it's a, it's definitely something where you have to have a lot of trust in the people you're working with and in the people you're reporting to, to be able to do that. But it's absolutely crucial to fighting these feelings of project fear. Um, not everyone has a trust first mentality, unfortunately, but I'd say by and large, most people going into, especially a new organization when you're onboarding, they're going to trust you until you give them a reason not to. That said, do remember rules about, you know, it takes five positives to offset a negative and that sort of thing. So realize that early on mistakes can hurt you. And often the best way I've found to avoid those mistakes or to regain that trust quickly is to call out your own mistakes when you see them versus trying to sweep them under the rug. <laughs> there is the case where you're just in the wrong organization. And so not to encourage the turnover, but in some cases it's very much warranted. So if you feel like you're in a situation where you don't have the trust of the people that you ultimately <laughs> report to or the trust of your team, you may want to evaluate if you want to move on to some place that's going to be a better fit. Um, there are some particularly, I actually, at Metal Toad, it was, it was kind of funny how it came about, but it was a joking context, but one day I was sitting down with some of our developers in a meeting, and they'd had a, a developer bill of rights, which actually had been really well upheld there for a long time. And one of them said, well, there's no project manager bill of rights. And I think it was like the next morning I had it drafted and ready to go. And, uh, it's a, definitely something to consider is, is your organization supportive of project managers? Do they say that or do they actually follow through on it? Um, and that's you know, both understanding the role and understanding that sometimes projects will fail. Uh, it's also not throwing project managers under the bus or having that be the role that expects to take the fall when a project goes wrong. That's not to say blame should really be placed anywhere, but it should also be a safe supporting situation where as a project manager, I can raise my hand and say, here's the three ways I screwed up. And then the next person at the table says, yeah, I could have done this better too. Um, I, that's a totally different topic, but blame-free retrospectives is a really important thing. Uh, and then it's also important for you to think about, in the case where you're feeling project fear, especially if you're in a client-facing organization or if you're just in a larger organization where there's multiple disciplines and groups and your project is for a different group, 
Is it the client or that other group that's causing more of the fear? Or is it your own team and your own internal organization and your fear of if you fail, what happens then? Uh, you don't ever want to be actively fearing for your job in your organization because of your organization and their expectations of you. A uh, big part of this is simply acknowledging that it's a thing, being aware of it and being able to step back and say, okay, I'm feeling this, I understand why, everybody else does too. So find peers. Um, I would definitely encourage you to go to meetup groups, to talk with other people in your organization, to talk with other people in other roles, here even. Um, share your stories, share examples of when it's happened to you, how you overcame it. Uh, realize in some cases it's just going to take empathy because there may not be an immediate solution. But definitely feel free to talk about it and I encourage you very much to talk about it. And ask a lot of questions. I know especially early on this can be kind of a polarizing thing where it can be kind of hard to raise your hand and say, hey, I don't know this. I think it actually, I, I take the opposite approach, which is I think it actually shows competence to ask questions. Um, there are dumb questions, but most are not dumb questions. So especially when you're onboarding, you know, it's the, I've done it this way before, is that how you expect to have it done? And it's not necessarily saying, hey, I don't know how to do this. It's, here's how I think this should be done. Does everybody else agree? Getting that type of team buy-in can be huge. Uh, spreading the project fear is one way to cope, where it's not necessarily that you should bear the entire burden. And if there's some legitimate reason to be concerned about the project and the success, everybody should own some part of that, not just the project manager. <laughs> Don't be Kanye, but <laughs> definitely feel free to pump yourself up. Um, I mean, I've done this sometimes even going into client, uh, client calls and that sort of thing where I felt like, oh, they're just gonna rail on us today. They're not happy with where we're at. There's the, I've never done it, but there's the like power pose in the bathroom sort of thing that's supposed to help boost self-confidence. But definitely think about, you know, own some of your own, for, especially for the nine out of 10 projects that you've probably had that have had a good amount of success. And even on any project that's failing, there's still some successes and some wins along the way. Own that you probably have some part in making those successful. Uh, you know, you wanna realize that you are a part of your own success. Um, you can also ask questions to try to evaluate internally in your organization, how you're doing. And often the problem I've run into is if you ask, just ask, hey, how am I doing? It's like, oh yeah, great, good job. And that's not actually that helpful. So think about types of questions you can ask that actually get more at the insights you're looking for. So that could be, you know, what are three ways I can improve? That's a good easy one to ask at your three month review when you started or something like that. Um, also, you know, seek other people who probably have the answers, seek people who may not have the answers, but ask in situational questions, how would you handle scenario X? And it doesn't necessarily give them a clear, and, and you know, you could follow that with, here's how I'd approach it, what do you think? And putting that type of thing out there is a good way to feel safe in the space of, you brought this up as an issue, and your plan is probably pretty sound, it may not be their ultimate suggestion, but at least it's gonna give you an idea of, yeah, that approach is in line with what we'd expect versus, no, let's go this direction on it. And this one is easier said than done, but when all else fails, there's a lot of science behind if you are able to go through the motions and fake it until you make it to some extent, and that that's relates to the self-confidence and bolstering the ego. But if you're able to say, I'm a confident project lead, I know what I'm doing, I've done this before, I know the general steps, and yes, there are gonna be some mistakes made along the way, but that happens to everybody. Faking it till you make it generally tends to instill, it's kind of one of those self-fulfilling things. It's like, if you act confident, you will be more confident. Uh, so realize that this applies on projects as well. If you feel like you are facing certain failure, especially on the certain failure project, hopefully you can call it out internally. Hopefully you can call it out to your client and just have a major reset and level set and okay, what do we need to go, where, where do we need to go from here? Uh, but it's definitely something that can work. It's not the appropriate approach for every situation, but in general, I'd say it has been really helpful to me to realize that, okay, this week I'm not feeling it. I'm kind of feeling afraid of where I'm at, but I have to show up and do my job. And generally you come out the other side realizing, oh, I survived that and I have a lot less fear than when I started. So, it's a fairly short presentation, but I wanna leave some time for Q&A and maybe even a little bit of group discussion. Uh, but I'd love to hear, and whether it's here or I can feel free to share my email afterwards, I'd love to hear personal stories, uh, feedback, areas you've related, 
it's probably not the last time I'll give this presentation, and I want to incorporate some other stories in addition to my own into it in the future. So, well, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>